Hey, everybody, I'm Chris Orthopedic Surgeon and Sports Medicine Physician, and today I'm talking to you about Ruby Rose, almost paralyzed. Or not. So, for those of you who don't know, Ruby Rose is an actress who has been involved with a number of projects, including Orange is the New Black, John Wick, and most recently, she has been cast as the lead in the TV series Batwoman, which is due to come out shortly. Recently, while filming, she suffered an injury to her neck and she had to undergo emergency surgery. There was not a lot of information about the mechanism of injury, but from what I understand, she suffered an injury to her cervical spine. It appears that she suffered disc herniations at the C5 and the C6 levels. Shortly after undergoing emergency surgery for her neck, Ruby Rose posted a video on Instagram of her experience of going through the emergency procedure and the rehabilitation immediately thereafter. Ruby stated that she required emergency surgery as a result of injuries she suffered while filming the Batwoman series. She stated that she was having symptoms of pain in her neck and in her upper extremities, and she was also having symptoms of numbness radiating down into her hands. She mentioned that without the surgery, there was a risk that her spinal cord might be severed and she might suffer from permanent paralysis. At the hands of the experienced spinal surgeon, Dr. Bray, she underwent an anterior decompression and two-level disc replacement surgery for her cervical spine. Dr. Bray commented after the procedure that all had gone well, and we can see afterwards that she was able to walk with assistance following her surgery. Dr. Bray went on to say that she would have normal function postoperatively and that she would be able to return to doing all of her normal activities, including her stunts. The first thing that's interesting to talk about here is what Ruby mentioned in her Instagram post. And she stated that there was a real possibility that she might be paralyzed as a result of her spinal cord being severed. She had disc herniations at two levels of her cervical spine, the C5 and the C6 level. And these herniations caused there to be significant pressure on the anterior or the front part of the spinal cord at those levels. And while there was enough pressure on the spinal cord for there to be neurologic deficits in the upper extremities, it is unlikely that her spinal cord would have actually been severed by the herniation of the disc material. It's unlikely that her spinal cord would have been severed by the disc material because the disc material itself is, is soft. So the disc material can be expelled out of the disc and it can put pressure onto the spinal cord itself, but it has no sharp edges and it is, um, it, it's not a rigid structure. So it's very difficult for that disc material to actually sever or cut the cord. The only way that I could even possibly imagine that that might happen is if it were expelled with a very sudden and violent force. But in that case, the spinal column or the vertebrae would actually probably be fractured and the relationship between one adjacent vertebrae to the next would have been disrupted. And so it would have been that that severed the spinal cord and not the disc. So yes, it's possible for her to be paralyzed, by the disc material that's extruded out of the disc, but it is not really possible for the disc material to actually sever or cut the spinal cord. Some of you might ask, well, how do we know that her, her spinal column was not disrupted? Well, we know that this was not the case because had that actually occurred, then number one, she most likely would have been paralyzed uh, and permanently so, not um, suffering just symptoms of numbness and tingling. Um, also, if there was a disruption of the spinal vertebrae, um, of one spinal ver vertebrae with respect to another, then she would have most definitely been treated with an anterior decompression and an instrumented fusion they would have, meaning they would have put bone graft, plate screws um, into her neck, and she she would not have had disc her, or disc replacement implants placed. So um, the disc replacement implants tells us that this was simply a compression issue as a result of disc material, but that there was no actual loss of structural stability of her spine. It is possible that she might have been paralyzed if the pressure was significant enough, 
but the possibility of her spinal cord actually being severed would have been pretty remote. She stated that she was experiencing symptoms that radiated from her neck down to her upper extremities, and in particular into her hands. And certainly, this is something that we would expect as a result of the level at which the spinal cord was compressed. Both the C5 and the C6 levels were involved with herniations at both levels. The C5 and the C6 nerve roots provide innervation of the shoulders and the arms radiating down into the thumbs on both sides. So it's quite possible that she would have had numbness or loss of motor function in those nerve root distributions or the areas that those nerve roots innervate. Dr. Bray also mentioned that she experienced problems with her balance and her gait. And this is also expected as a result of the compression of the spinal cord itself. Now for this procedure, Dr. Bray performed an anterior decompression, meaning he approached the cervical spine through the front. Although it is possible that you could approach the cervical spine through a posterior approach as well, Dr. Bray elected to go through the anterior or through the front as a result of the area where the pathology was located. Meaning that the disc was herniated in the front of the spinal column, so he decided to go to that area directly. The first part of the procedure, Dr. Bray removed the disc material that was pressing on the front of the spinal cord. And he did this at both the C5 and the C6 levels. Once the spinal cord was decompressed, in other words, once he removed the disc material, then it was important for him to decide what needed to be done between the C5, C6 and the C6, C7 vertebrae. In the past, Dr. Bray would likely have performed an instrumented fusion of the cervical spine, placing bone graft between the cervical vertebrae at these levels and supplementing this with plate and screw fixation of the adjacent vertebrae. However, now there are newer implants which allow us to retain the motion between adjacent vertebrae. Spinal surgeons are able to implant artificial vertebral discs between the spinal vertebrae to allow movement between adjacent vertebrae rather than eliminating movement with a spinal fusion. After her decompression, Ruby Rose received two vertebral disc implants at the C5 and at the C6 level, which would allow her to move her neck in a natural way following the decompression procedure. Each vertebral disc implant consists of two metal components which articulate with one another, separated by a plastic liner or spacer that allows movement between the two. Typically, these implants are held in place by what is known as a press fit. And this basically means that we have a space of a given size, for example, six millimeters, in between which we put an implant of a slightly larger size, for example, seven or eight millimeters. The implant is held in place by the compressive force between adjacent vertebrae. Also, the implants have surfaces that are coated with a special coating named hydroxyapatite. Hydroxyapatite is a compound which stimulates osteoblasts, or the bone producing cells, to produce and lay down more bone. As the implants are coated with this compound, bone from the vertebrae is encouraged to grow onto the implants as a result of this coating. The end result after she recovers is that Ruby Rose will have a cervical spine that moves like normal, feels like normal, and allows her to do all of the things that she was used to prior to her injury. Now it's interesting to note, this is not the first spinal surgery that she has had. In 2018, she underwent surgery on her lower spine as a result of long-standing issues that she had had in the past. And given the fact that Ruby Rose is only in her early 30s, it's kind of unfortunate that she's already had to undergo two major spinal surgeries. And we can only hope that she recovers well and that she continues to be as active in the future as she has been in the past with projects such as John Wick 2 and Batman. That being said, I hope she recovers well and I'm anxious to see what projects she moves on to in the future. So today, I've been discussing Ruby Rose and her cervical injury, almost paralyzed or not. And as always, that's been a word from Dr. Chris, not your everyday ortho.